Is that working? Can you hear the back? Good, that sounds like it's working. Um, welcome to the Arts Catalyst. Uh, welcome to regulars who've been here before. And welcome to people who haven't come and encountered the Arts Catalyst before. Um, this is uh, an evening, a part of an event called um, Novel Forms and New Materialities, uh, at the start of which was a creative writing workshop this afternoon. And this evening we've got uh, the science writer Philip Ball, artist Melanie Jackson, and Professor of Political Aesthetics Esther Leslie. And they're going to be talking about uh, where the cutting edge of science is taking us uh, culturally. As molecular biology and nanotechnology start to merge and we move into an era where new uh, biological entities and materials are being created, what is that meaning for us as a culture and uh, as a society? What are the implications? Uh, where has this where has this technology come from? What has been the precedence for it? And, and particularly, what does it mean for artists? And how can artists engage with this? What are the new, what are the new materialities? What are the new narratives? What are the new possibilities um, that, these, uh, that this science and technology is taking us towards? I'm going to... Um, the Arts Catalysts kind of have been involved in this for a number of years. We've been particularly interested in, in biotechnology and how artists are engaging with biotechnology. And last year we ran a workshop uh, that was with Oren Katz of Symbiotica at the University of Western Australia and with Daisy Ginsberg. And uh, we, were, we brought together a group of artists, <coughs> scientists, uh, writers, social scientists to think about synthetic biology which is the application of engineering principles to biology in the creation of new living systems and biological entities. It was a very hands-on workshop. Uh, it, it was introducing the practitioners to the actual techniques that happen in laboratories, but it was also trying to explore what the cultural, aesthetic, social and political implications and ethical implications are of synthetic biology. Out of that, we've, um, we've been commissioning uh, Melanie Jackson to create a new work, which she's doing in collaboration with Esther Leslie. And that's going to be shown at the John Hansard Gallery in Southampton uh, in January 2013. So uh, tonight is a kind of marking point along the way there um, between the synthesis workshop that happened last year and the transformism exhibition that will happen in January. We've got the, the three speakers of Philip Ball, um, Melanie Jackson and Esther Leslie. We're going to start uh, this evening with Philip's presentation, um, and then we're going to have a question and answer. Then we'll take a break, and then Melanie and Esther will be presenting together. So there'll be um, hopefully plenty of time for discussion, for you to bring in your inputs. Uh, I think there are a few people here who took part in the synthesis workshop as well, so it'd be really interesting to hear from them um, about their work and about their thinking and where they've got to. So I'm going to start by introducing Philip. Uh, Philip Ball is a science writer. He worked for Nature magazine for 20 years. He has a background in physics and chemistry. Uh, he's written a whole succession of books, uh, including uh, books on new materials in the 21st century and, uh, and the history of molecules. So I think Philip is, um, is the perfect person to give us a bit of an introduction to this new territory of materials. So I'll hand over to Philip. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Um, I've got no idea what you were hoping to hear about tonight, which I suppose is a, possibly a good thing. Um, but we'll see how it goes. To, uh, to talk about is our changing relationship to materials and materiality. Primarily, I'm going to look through the lens of the technological advances that have been happening, but I also want to try to give some nods towards the social and cultural influences that affect and inform this question. 
I think that in order to understand where we're headed, we need to have some perspective on where we've come from. Uh, so I propose to the one can loosely identify several distinct eras of materiality with kind of um, self-centeredly uh, compressed timescales as we get closer to the present. Um, so for a long time, we resided, I'm going to use the... We resided in the Herculean era. Um, which um, used materials in a monolithic, uh, indeed sometimes megalithic way, um, often in the quite literal meaning of that word, so it used big stones. Um, and in, in early times, these were natural materials like stone and wood, um, but then towards the end of this era, there were technologically extracted materials, metals, that uh, began to be used to make these great constructions. Um, and then after that, for want of a better term, comes the steampunk era, which is um, um, an era when synthetic and semi-synthetic materials started to appear. And these were found usually by trial and error. I don't think I need this, actually. This is small enough. By, by serendipity and trial and error, mostly. Um, and they were materials like bakelite and cellulo uh, celluloid and nylon. And they were often promoted as cheaper look-alike substitutes for natural materials that were expensive, like ivory and silk and hardwoods. Then came the, the Dandere era, and this is uh, when materials began to be made to order, uh, and some, to some extent by design. And you get started to find quite sophisticated things like composite materials, fiberglass and so on. And you can see that really now the synthetic is celebrated almost with a kind of fetishistic smoothness uh, and, and a blandness of texture and of contour. Um, and we can see during this time the appearance of the first really sort of genuinely high-tech materials uh, such as Kevlar, the super strong polymer. And then there was the Walkman era, and this is when miniaturization really starts to set in. For example, the advent of personalized computers and portable electronics, or more broadly, with the notion that technologies are, were becoming decentralized and portable and malleable to some extent. So the materials now start to vanish beneath the design, and it no longer seems really to matter much what things are made of, um, uh, or, or what they look like they're made of even. Materials become, to an extent, housings for information. Um, on bit, bit behind these bland shells, there's often highly engineered materials, electronic materials designed to hold and transmit information, optical fibers and silicon chips and optical recording media. And this trend is now, I think, being taken to its logical conclusion in the <coughs> invisible era. So the object now is that a material will in some sense disappear from view, to do its job unnoticed, sometimes literally out of sight. Um, you know, you don't really think now what the Kindle is made of. Um, I mean, it's actually made of extraordinary materials, um, but we don't really, uh, we're not supposed to think or notice that. Um, and as a result, the relationship between form and function has begun to disappear. You can't always guess what these things do by just looking at them. Um, and indeed, some of them don't look a single way at all. Down in the corner here, there's a, a reconfigurable robot. It's just a prototype. But what this means is that it just changes its shape according to the job that it has to do. And I've really focused here on IT applications. But uh, this idea of invisible materials also extends, for example, to biomedicine with implants and prostheses, which are designed now to be literally invisible to the body. So the body doesn't even know they're there, or even to merge with the body. So bone replacement materials, for example, are no longer things like titanium that are just meant to stay there and not rust and you know, be, do, do their job. Um, they, but, but rather, there are materials that are designed to be absorbed by the body, to be colonized by bone, uh, to be interpreted by the body as if they were bone. Or you can think of things like solar cells that are, can be built into windows. See, you don't even know that they're there. 
Or in the, if you think of the increasing persona of the car, which, kind of like the iPod, is now a, a, a kind of hermetically sealed box. You don't know what's going on inside, and you can't affect what's going on inside. And if it goes wrong, then you're stuck. Um, now, we, one can play this game uh, rather arbitrarily of dividing up uh, t uh, time this way, and I don't intend to suggest that these, these categories be taken too seriously, but the serious point, I hope, is that in one way or another, our relationship to materials and what we expect of them has changed over the ages. And that's why the old visions of the future were wrong. They correctly imagined that these new technologies would be increasingly pervasive, but uh, they didn't, but, 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 but you know, they figured that we'd be surrounded by their physical presence, whereas uh, actually increasingly we just don't notice them, they're absent, they're out of sight. And we now have the ultimate expression of this form of, uh, of, of materials and structures designed literally to, uh, to disappear, because we can make invisibility cloaks, which can carve out spaces that light can't reveal. And I'll come back uh, later on to exactly what's going on there. One of the considerations um, inherent in these examples is that the distinction between the material and the structure is becoming eroded. You see, once a material was a fabric that would be fashioned to a shape that was designed to make it a component to do its job, and these components would then be put together, they sort of mesh together to create some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, mechanism. Now, it's not uncommon for the material itself to be the mechanism. It might change shape or change its properties, such as its transparency or its conductivity or, or even its chemical composition in response to some signal from the environment. Um, now, a, a very uh, familiar and quite old example of this is photochromic glass. Um, but I've shown here a more recent one, which is a kind of polymer, a kind of polymer gel that expands or shrinks depending on the pH of the material flowing past. And so you can make these little smart valves, which have no moving parts really. It's just that the little polymer posts expand to block off this space, uh, depending on what's flowing down this channel here. And I kind of think of this uh, evolution in terms of the, uh, the Terminator films, where, you, you, you know, to begin with, the old-style Terminator had very evident physical moving parts, um, but the new design uh, didn't have any mechanism at all. It was just stuff that did the job of the mechanism. Um, these considerations uh, illustrate just two of the trends that I want to, to suggest about the changes in our relationship to materials and uh, material technologies. And that is um, that the scales of engineering are becoming smaller and the devices and functions are becoming ever less assemblies of materials and more that they're, they're embodied in the materials themselves. And then I'd suggest that the uh, the, the emphasis now is increasingly on the interface with these systems. In fact, the interface often defines the function. I mean, you know, we're, we're surrounded by these interfaces where you know, a lot of the thought has gone into that. And as a result of that, I think there's starting to be an erosion of boundaries of where uh, you know, one entity ends and another begins, where we end and where um, you know, uh, extensions of ourselves begin in, in uh, our smartphones or whatever. There's um, also, uh, and re related to this really, uh, material systems are increasingly being defined in terms of their information content. Um, and I'll try to sort of uh, illustrate a little more what I mean by that now. But uh, uh, along with that is the idea that the information itself is now kind of an abstract thing. It's a protein thing. It doesn't have to be, we don't any longer worry about whether it's encoded in, you know, in a magnetic, magnetic tape or in uh, a, an optical fiber or, or whatever. In fact, you know, the information is completely exchangeable. It just gets Bluetooth to these things that hold information somehow. The Components of a lot of leading edge technologies now are, um, are not being put together laboriously, they're being programmed with this embodied information that they contain to assemble themselves. Um, and um, this 
this philosophy isn't just uh, uh, being applied to sort of you know high tech electronics or whatever. It's it's something that's expanding to other areas of uh, of creativity. I would say, including our architecture. This is a quote I've got here from Skylar Tibbetts, an, an a, a, a futuristically thinking architect at MIT, who says. Rather than taking raw materials, sending them through a machine or process that is inherently fighting tolerances, er errors, and energy consumption to arrive at a desired product, we should be directly embedding assembly information into raw materials, then watching as the materials assemble themselves. And I'll give some examples of that happening soon. And um, as we sort of heard hinted at already, there's an increasing tendency to look to biology, to the living world, both for inspiration, that is the, 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 uh, the discipline loosely called biomimetics, and as a means of actually making these things. And that's where uh, synthetic biology and biotechnology generally can come in. Now, what's driving these, these trends? What's enabling them? Um, I want to focus on uh, the technological aspects of, of that answer. And, and one of them is that, um, as I say, engineering is becoming uh, smaller. We're able to do things at increasingly small scales. And here's just an example of the kind of structures that electronic engineers are routinely making now, which are basically defined with atomic precision. These are layers of semiconductors where, in a sense, each of the little dots that you can see here, you can regard it as an atom. So these layers are just several atoms thick, and they're specified exactly to the number of atomic layers, how thick they'll be. And these uh, multi-layer structures uh, do have various um, uh, properties that are useful for uh, electronic engineering. And they're made by kind of letting atoms rain down on a surface. And you can control that in a way that, that, uh, that, that the build-up of, uh, of the material is atomically precise. Um, and this atom craft is becoming, is, has got to the level where we can move individual atoms around. And that was uh, what was done in this top image here, which uh, shows each one of those little blue bumps is a single xenon atom shoved around with a tiny, tiny little needle tip on the surface of nickel so that it spells out IBM. And it's, this is the kind of device that, uh, that is uh, allowing this work. And, um, this, at the same time, the traditional techniques of engineering, like uh, machining and etching and welding, they're being shrunk too, and that's um, enabling us to make uh, mechanical devices like these tiny little cogs dwarfed by a mite here. And um, we can now, I showed one of the, I showed this Br Br Brunel bridge earlier on, we can now make bridges so small that the, their behavior, their vibrations are controlled by quantum mechanics and people are hoping that it will be possible, it will very, very soon be possible to be able to see the vib a bridge like this vibrating in two different quantum mechanical states at the same time. So in effect, you can say that the bridge is will actually be in two places at once and we'll be able to see that because it's small enough to be sensitive to those quantum effects. Now, all of this stuff is, of course, um, uh, calling on the discipline of nanotechnology. And I want to just say a brief word about what we should understand by that word. I mean, it's generally considered that nanotechnology is simply engineering at very small scales, typically less than a hundred millionths of a millimeter, which is to say a, a, a few hundred nanometers. And the sorts of things that scientists are interested in doing with nanotechnology are rather different from some of the popular images that we see of little robots floating down our bloodstream and, and clearing out invaders. No one is terribly interested in this particular vision of nanotechnology, not least because it's not at all clear that it would work. Um, but what they are interested in doing is in particular doing things like keep writing information at very small scales. And here, literally, that's been done um, by using one of these kind of uh, needle probe uh, little microscopes to write part of the foundational text of nanotechnology by Richard Feynman in 1960 at a scale where the letters are just a few nanometers wide. Um, and it's also often interested in making use of these uh, strange properties that matter seems to acquire when it's small enough to be affected by quantum mechanics. And here's uh, an example of that, where we find uh, people are making these tiny little particles, nanoparticles, of semiconductors and metals. And here's one, where again, each dot is really an atom. Um, and when they get this small, you find that the color 
of, the, of, of these little particles depends on how big they are, which is really weird. Um, that, that's all it depends on. And so these are solutions of different nanoscale particles of a semiconductor, um, which have uh, which is just different sizes. And that alone is enough to give them these different colors. So you, now you can uh, you pr would probably imagine that manipulating things on this scale is very cumbersome, and indeed it is if you're pushing atoms around. It's very, it takes a long time to build anything. But there's another uh, possibility on offer for working at this scale, because we're starting to develop a good grasp of the uh, the rules that allow the molecules of life to assemble themselves into complicated structures like this one here, which is the tobacco mosaic virus, which is in, in which these individual protein molecules and a coil of genetic material of RNA build themselves together into these rod-like particles. They just do it spontaneously. And um, having this kind of understanding means that instead of having to put every single part in place by hand, as it were, we can program the, 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 the components to assemble themselves. Chemistry is starting to be able to do that. It's moved beyond being a science of the molecule to being a science of groups of molecules that can behave collectively. And here's just an example of the kind of thing that can be done to uh, build these sort of uh, tubular-like um, entities from these molecules here, these molecular components that just assemble themselves, uh, stuck together with these little metal atoms. And this uh, self-assembly happens uh, even at the, the simple level of how crystals form, to get form from atoms, how they form into these very, very regular, uh, highly ordered and symmetrical patterns. And we can use the same kind of principles to make a different sort of crystal from tiny little, in this case, tiny little uh, polystyrene balls, microscopic in size. And we can just allow them to assemble themselves into these very regular stacks, which turn out to have useful properties um, in terms of how they reflect and transmit light, so they can be used in, um, in optical technologies. Um, and we can put, use these same tricks at bigger scales. So here, um, there are tiny little three-dimensional circuit uh, devices, there are little components with circuits etched on their surfaces, half a centimetre across. And because of the, the way uh, some of these faces of the, of the objects have been coated, they will assemble themselves spontaneously. If you just chuck them in water, they'll build themselves into these sorts of structures. So this works at big scales, too. Um, at the other extreme, we can do extraordinary things at the smallest scales with this kind of idea of self-assembly. And in particular, you can do it with DNA, because DNA comes, uh, uh, it's one of the molecules that is best understood in terms of how the information dictates the way it behaves, the way it builds itself. It's the information in the two strands of the double helix that allow them to join together in particular ways. And if you can specify that information in, in, um, in, in uh, well-defined ways, you can make strands of DNA that will fold and stick to each other in all sorts of ways. And each of these tiny little entities is made of DNA, tailor-made by chemical means, to fold up into these structures. These are really tiny. This is the length of a single cell of the bacterium, E. coli. So this is the kind of thing that's becoming possible with self-assembly. However, molecular self-assembly in living organisms is much more complicated even than that. I mean, it builds structures like this. This looks like a kind of a fuzzy image of a machine, and it really is a machine, but it's a biological machine made from proteins. It's this machine here that drives the rotation of the flagellum, these sort of whip-like appendages that bacteria have that whip around and allow them to swim through, um, through, through water. Um, so this is a sort of rotary motor that does that. And then you, you see uh, structures like this, which are a weird mixture of sort of like the regular geometric and crystalline and sort of organic. This is a, a, a virus particle here. Um, and we haven't uh, even begun to approach this sort of level of sophistication. What we also find is that, um, as well as building devices like this, 
nature is able to use self-assembly, molecular self-assembly, to build really fantastic materials. And what you tend to find with nature's materials is that they're structured at many levels, at many different scales. You find particular structures, and the, 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 the properties that come from them depend on having all those structures. And these, and this is called a hierarchical structure, and this is what it looks like for silk. Um, which uh, sort of folds up, it, it's made from a protein that folds up and then builds little crystallites and then they pack together in certain ways and as a result you get this stuff that is stronger than steel and yet flexible and, uh, and that builds itself out of water without any high temperature processing or anything to make this extraordinary material. Um, it's also biodegradable. Um, and if we can start to understand how the basic molecules are programmed with information that converts itself into structure at all these levels spontaneously, then we'll really be getting somewhere. Now, I want to say just a brief word about this idea of learning from nature, of mimicking nature, um, of so-called uh, biomimetics or biomimicry, because there's a dangerous allure to the notion that somehow nature has already found all the best solutions for engineering and all we need to do is copy them. There's absolutely no reason why that should be true. Um, the challenges in the natural world are, and those of engineering sometimes may overlap, but they're not identical. Biology doesn't have to cope, on the whole, with really high temperatures. Um, and so if you're doing aerospace engineering, where you're going to be exposed to 1,000 you know, degrees or more, then it's no good trying to work with biological materials. You need these super hard ceramics and special metal alloys and so on. Nature doesn't make a lot of use of wheels. In fact, uh, I show these are nature's wheels. They only seem to come uh, to crop up at the smallest scales, at the nano scale. You don't see them anywhere else. Um, whereas, you know, they're very useful for us. Nature doesn't have much use for electrical conduction by metals. It does. It, it gets uh, its electricity around, if you like, by other means. And perhaps most importantly, the constraints the, the on, on nature are quite different from those in technology. Nature has its own economics, but it's not an economics of you know, pounds and dollars. It's an economics mostly of energy, how much energy it takes to do something. And that means that it can take a long time to do something if it means it doesn't need much energy. So if we want to make an analog of a tropical hardwood, we generally don't have the sort of 10 years or so that nature um, uh, uses to develop a material like that. And nature is very conservative with the materials that it uses. It tends to do everything with just a handful of, of raw ingredients, amino acids and oils and sugars and uh, nucleic acids, pretty much. Which is amazing, but doesn't mean that we have to be limited to those materials either. So instead of looking to nature slavishly um, to sort of copy what it does, it, it's better to just look for inspiration, to look at the kinds of general tricks that it uses, and then to maybe embody those in different uh, with different materials and different systems. And this is an example of that, where um, this is a, a new kind of solar cell that is potentially extremely cheap and can just be literally sort of sprayed onto surfaces. Um, and uh, it takes its inspiration from a leaf, but it doesn't look at all like a leaf. It consists of these tiny, in fact, nanoscale little particles of titania. And titania is very cheap stuff. It's just basically the pigment in white paint. And these little grains are coated with a purple dye that absorbs light. Um, and that when it does, it spits out electrons and creates an electrical current. And so it, it, these solar cells are being developed now, just being commercialized now. And the inspiration that they get from the leaf isn't at all obvious. It's just a, it, 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 uh, the way it um, harvests light uh, helps to prevent some of the light from being wasted as heat. Uh, so it helps to get more of it as electricity rather than heat, uh, using a trick, uh, the kind of trick that you find in the leaf, um, but you know without any of the sort of material components that nature uses. Now, in, in, a, in a lot of these biological examples I've talked about, you can uh, you can see this influence of regarding biology itself as an information science, and that's something that's becoming increasingly prevalent. And the idea that um, information can be encoded in biomolecules and that this information can define the organism, its structure and its growth and its evolution, this goes back, of course, most notably to the discovery of the structure of DNA 60 years ago and the genetic code. But there's now a growing appreciation that molecular biology actually processes information and stores information at many different levels and scales, not just in DNA. 
um, in, the, in the, the, the genetic code of DNA. So information is passed around between living cells, enables them to coordinate their activities. And it's stored, how it's stored and how it's released and utilized in the genome is also a much more complicated question than just the question of what the, 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 the code is, reading the, 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 genetic, uh, the, the, the genetic sequence of the DNA. For example, which genes are active in a cell depends on how the DNA is folded up and how it's organized three-dimensionally within the, uh, the inside of the, of the cell. And a lot of the information that's encoded in DNA is actually overwritten or modified by chemical changes that are made to it subsequently. So there's a great deal here that we still don't really understand about how information is, uh, what role it plays in biology. And until we do, our ability to intervene in and to engineer life will be severely constrained. And that brings me to uh, synthetic biology, um, uh, which can be regarded in some respects as the arena in which engineering, the engineering ethos, and the lessons and approaches of nanotechnology intersect with our understanding of living systems. And um, as Nicholas said earlier, it's really sort of generally regarded that um, synthetic biology is the systematic rational design of living systems uh, according to engineering principles. That's something that began with the development of genetic engineering in the 1970s. Um, so where, that's when we developed the ability to, to snip out genes from a genome and to stick in new ones using enzymes to do that. And that enabled people to develop, for example, bacteria that would uh, be able to produce insulin in, in great sort of fermentation vats so that you wouldn't any longer need to extract it from mammals. Um, but even in this arena of genetic engineering of bacteria to make useful substances like insulin, it soon became apparent that you know, for a lot of substances you might want to get, you can't just do it by sticking in a gene or sticking in a couple of genes. Um, for example, uh, attempts to get bacteria to make the anti-malarial drug, artemisinin, this little thing on the end here, this complicated molecule, um, it's made naturally by a kind of plant, and there, so there are genes that, uh, that, that do that, but there are lots of them. If, uh, you, this looks complicated, but basically every one of these little arrows is a, 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 a different gene. And so you've got to put all of those into uh, an organism that you want to make this stuff, and get them to switch on and off in just the right way, in just the right sort of combination and at the right time. And that's complicated. What it really amounts to is redesigning the whole metabolic pathway of the organism. And that's uh, complicated, and that's where you really have to start thinking in terms of synthetic biology rather than the old style genetic engineering. Uh, you have to rewire the whole genome, in effect. And the same is true if we want to re redesign bacteria to make useful, uh, to make biofuels like ethanol or, um, or uh, to, to, to make other drugs. And part of the reason why um, the, the, the rewiring of genomes is difficult, um, even in bacteria, is that they're so complicated. And in particular, there's a lot in a bacterial genome, even, that you don't need if all it's going to do in your, gen in your engineered organism is to sit in a vat and produce eth ethanol. And that's why some synthetic biologists have been uh, keen to simplify genomes, particularly bacterial genomes, to strip them back to just the essentials that are needed to keep an organism alive. And that was the motivation for the well-known work by Craig Venter and his colleagues to make so-called synthetic organisms, where they stripped out the genomes of living organisms and replaced them with genomes that have been tailor-made chemically, using automated chemical technology to build the DNA with a, 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 a content, a genetic content, that is completely specified by the designer. And Venter hopes that or, synthetic organisms like this will act as a kind of chassis for tailor-made microbes that will produce useful things like biofuels and hydrogen. Um, other efforts to reprogram cells have a more sort of explicitly um, engineering uh, uh, feel to them. So, for example, people have programmed, uh, uh, have put in little genetic circuits into bacteria to make them flash on and off, to flash on and off uh, with light. Um, or, uh, for example, to be able to sense one another's presence, or to light up if they detect particular chemicals in their environment. Or, in this case, to act as photographic film by being switched 
to a dark state when light falls on them. Now, um, I've talked about gaining control over materials' properties by designing them at the atomic level, and now we're starting to go even further than that, to, to design the atoms themselves. And I don't mean by that to design real atoms, although, in fact, even that is starting to become possible. Um, rather, I mean that there's an emerging class of materials that are built from components that can be regarded as a kind of artificial atom with tailored properties. And then you put these atoms together to make what is called a meta-material. And uh, this is what one of them look, looks like. And these little things are the uh, artificial atoms in this case. And they're pretty big in, in this material, although you can see them with the naked eye. This is, these are printed circuit boards where uh, they've been etched to create these little sort of squared C shapes in, um, in uh, copper, uh, uh, copper film. Um, so that they are act, in this case, that, that means that they act as um, antenna to pick up uh, um, electromagnetic signals, to pick up light, basically, although um, it's going to be light that has a wavelength of a similar size to the size of these components, which here is a few millimetres, so it's actually going to pick up microwaves. And these, uh, these uh, little atoms will pick up microwaves and then re-radiate them to another one. And this way, the micro microwaves can go progress through a material. That's exactly how light gets through a transparent material like glass. It's absorbed and re-radiated by the atoms. Um, but here, you can design the atoms to, uh, to do that process in a way that just isn't possible with ordinary substances, with ordinary um, atoms. And in particular, you can get it to do weird things, to do weird things with optics. For example, you can give uh, one of these materials a so-called negative refractive index, which means that when light gets refract refracted through it, um, so you know when light goes into a glass of water you, and there's something standing in it, it get, looks bent because the light is refracted. It's bent as it goes through the water. You can make a metal material to bend the light the wrong way. And uh, what that would sort of look like, um, if you could do it, um, it, with, with light is, you know, this is the sort of normal situation and it would sort of look like this, it would look weird. So you've done something strange to the optics there. Um, and this sort of behaviour can be useful, for example, to make uh, a new kind of lens, but the range of possibilities with these metamaterials is much more dramatic than that. Um, you can, for example, design these atoms so that each one is a bit different and so that it can be used to sort of guide light along a particular path. And in particular, you can make it guide light gently around uh, an object within them. Something that you can't see because um, th these are using the sort of components that I showed earlier. The little atoms here are uh, too big to, to interact with visible light. It inter it's an invisibly cloaked for microwaves and it does the job. So if microwaves are sort of shone in plain here through this thing, they'll get bent round and, uh, and reformed on the other side. And um, the, uh, what's more, the science that has stemmed from these developments, um, well, in, in fact, uh, it's now becoming possible, I should say, to, to shrink the size of cloaks like this to get down to the scale of visible light so that the, so that the, the artificial atoms are small enough that they will interact with light with a shorter wavelength. And this is the kind of thing that uh, is being made. And this is a kind of invisibility cloak for almost visible light. It's actually just in the infrared. Um, so that when infrared light passes through this, um, it, coming out the other side, you don't see this bump here. It looks like it's just a flat bottom there. So we're getting to the level of being able to make you know, real invisibility, invisibility cloaks for, 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 for light. Um, and this science, is, uh, uh, which has become known as an area called transformation optics, um, it's led to the realisation that actually you can make invisibility cloaks more easily than you think if they're sort of partial. So you can hide, you can hide a hole, but the cloak itself won't be invisible. You can do that using uh, natural minerals that have the property of birefringence, which means that light travels in different uh, directions at different speeds. Calcite is like that, and here's a block of, this is what I showed er earlier, this is a block of natural calcite shaped um, to, to be able to cre essentially create uh, an invisible region here where it, just, uh, it looks as though this roll of pink paper just isn't there. So you can see the cloak, but you can't see the thing that it's cloaking. Um, and 
all sorts of astounding things are being uh, are being sort of dreamed up for these metamaterials. Uh, so, for example, people are talking about being able to do, uh, open up a wormhole for light, so that essentially you, you've got this uh, sort of invisible stuff here, but you 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 just got a little. It's almost like an invisible screen that is showing you something that's going on outside in the street, just because it's being guided by this uh, by this metamaterial. But it goes even beyond that. People are talking about making uh, not just invisibility cloaks, but space-time cloaks, where you can hide something that happened in time. <laughs> so the idea is you, you'd have security cameras, say, in an art gallery, um, you know, that, that are sort of uh, filming the um, the gallery, and you, would, you, you know, you might be watching them, and suddenly you, you see the artwork just vanishes. And the reason it does that is that uh, the robbers have used one of these space-time cloaks to uh, interfere with the, 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 with, with the way light is coming off that scene. Someone has come in, taken the object and gone off, but what's then been done is that the light from that, from that scene, the, uh, the light from before the robber entered and the light from after he left has been stretched and joined up and the bit in the middle has been taken out. And this is something that is, uh, it sounds crazy, but it's, it's already been demonstrated that you can perform this kind of space-time cloaking with these materials. Um, and I, I, I think there could be hardly anything more representative uh, uh, of the, my so-called age of invisibility than this. But I think that metamaterials point to another consideration too, because as we've become more adept at materials, uh, making materials by design, we can start to redefine the very boundaries of what is and isn't considered possible by physical laws. We find ourselves making materials that do things not just better than before, but that do things that we've never imagined possible before. Um, now, I want to say, uh, finish by just saying a little bit about some of the social drivers behind some of these developments. Um, and the question really is whether this uh, science is uh, is creating our culture, or whether it's responding to what the culture wants. And, you know, of course, inevitably, it's a bit of both. Um, but let me point to just a few issues that have been sort of informing these new materialities. Um, and one of them is medicine. Um, and there's a crisis in medicine because there are ever few, fewer drugs being developed for various reasons. Um, but at the same time, we're all tending to live longer, and so there's more of a demand for things like uh, regenerative tissue engineering um, for things that, well, if we're going to live longer, then we're increasingly looking for ways that will overcome the degeneration that comes with age. We're also starting to realise how crude our drugs are, and that's very evident with anti-cancer drugs, that, you know, we, uh, we, we have to take them and hope that they kill the tumour before they kill us. They're just t nasty things, basically. Um, and what you really want is a, a drug that only goes for the tumour, and nanotechnology is being used to, to uh, develop drugs that will do that, to uh, encapsulate the, the anti-cancer drugs within some kind of nanoparticle that can find its way specifically to tumor cells and latch on and then release a drug into them. And there's also a wish to develop drugs uh, more smartly. I mean, it's, you know, again, it's crazy the way we take pills that um, we, it means we get a big dose and then it gradually fades away and we get another big dose. And the same is true for the way insulin is, is typically administered to diabetics, that it's, you know, it's this sort of, this kind of process, whereas what we really want is a steady input. And so developments um, in nanotechnology and tissue engineering and so on are helping us make implants and devices that can release drugs in a much more controlled and smarter way. It's also become, uh, long been known, in fact, that there are all kinds of uh, biomolecular markers in our bodies of uh, incipient disease that are, are there before there are any clinical symptoms. This is certainly true for cancer. Um, that if we could detect them, um, then, we could, uh, uh, th then we could start to treat things like cancer much more easily. And that's absolutely crucial to a successful uh, prognosis. And so there's interest in developing biotech uh, nanotechnological devices that can continually sample what's in our blood and tell us what that, you know, what that is telling us about what's going on in our body and uh, early markers of disease. There's also um, drivers from, the, uh, from the, the development of genomics, the fact that you know, we're now told that uh, very soon all of us will be able to have our own personal genome analysis. Um, and that that will inform the medicine that we're given. We'll have this sort of personalized medicine. And that will be possible only if genome uh, um, sequencing becomes cheap enough. 
And the, the likelihood is that if it does, it's not going to use the techniques that have been used so far. It's going to use something like this, and this is now becoming just commercialized, where um, basically the DNA, your DNA, if you like, is going to be fed through a little hole, and depending on which chemicals, which uh, types of uh, 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 bases sit on the DNA in the hole, that determines what current starts to, what electrical current uh, feeds through this material. And so you can just read the genome just by pulling the, the DNA through these, uh, through these tiny little pores. There's also, of course, an increasing uh, em emphasis on making technologies cleaner. And I've talked about uh, doing that with solar cells and new uh, materials for cleaning water and the, the use of synthetic biology for trying to produce green fuels in, um, in better ways. Um, and of course, I, information technology um, has, uh, has been a big driver for a lot of these things. And in particular, it's, um, it, it's worth thinking about what, what, you know, what it's doing, that it's really, um, it, it's, it's created an acceleration of obsolescence and, and expect almost a feeling that we have a right to things getting better an ever closer time horizon on which we expect things to be, we expect next year's model to be better than this year's. And that's something that's really quite new. And that's only going to be possible if, uh, if we can sustain this increasing miniaturization that's being taken place. And the problem is that we're now very soon looking at the physical limits that, uh, that on which silicon uh, devices can be shrunk, on which silicon chips can be shrunk. So we'll need something else. And no one knows what that's going to be. One of the candidates um, are these uh, objects called carbon nanotubes, which are a few nanometers wide and are made from pure carbon. They're basically individual sheets uh, of graphite uh, rolled up on themselves, and they often tend to come in the form of sort of Russian doll nested uh, cylinders like this. And they conduct electricity, and people have made uh, transistors from them already. And they're surprisingly easy to make just by condensing carbon vapour in the right way. Um, and as I say, they're a kind of tubular form of graphite. If you open up a nanotube, um, then you get this other uh, new wonder material called graphene, which is just a flat sheet of graphite-like carbon, a single sheet. So it's a single atom thick. Um, and this too conducts electricity, and, uh, and the, the, the people are thinking in terms of using this just to sort of cut out the sheet in some way to make, um, to make circuits that way, rather than having to sort of deposit stuff. You just, you, it's a sort of subtractive way of, of, making, um, uh, of making very, very small electronic devices. No one really knows whether um, silicon electronics is really going to be replaced by carbon electronics or whether it will be something else. But something is surely going to, uh, to come and it will, be, it will depend on finding the right materials. And finally, I just want to touch very briefly on some of the, the sort of ge more general societal issues that are, that are raised by a lot of these um, technologies. And one of them is uh, very much talked about is privacy which sort of um, arises in all sorts of ways. Um, I mean, it's, you know, it, we, we sort of talk about who should have access to your email, who should have access to your genome data, um, which is going to be a very, very tri tricky issue. You know, who are you, would you be obliged to reveal that to, if anyone? Uh, should you even be informed about it yourself if you aren't informed about, you know, what, what, what you find in, in your genome? But also there are um, new materials developments are giving rise to things like little radio frequency to tags that you can stick on anything. You know, you can stick them on bins. They're already stuck on rubbish bins to identify which, what they are. And you can track these. You can, there's an extraordinary amount of information that we have just, but that we uh, make available, if you like, just by carrying mobile phones around. Um, you know, where we are, um, and in fact, where we are seems to almost have a fingerprint of who we are. Um, and th they also have little accelerometers in them, so that you can t people can tell how fast you're moving. An amazing amount of information there. Um, and, um, um, uh, 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 of course, you know, there are uh, considerations like, I mean, I just did this uh, this afternoon. I just thought I'd go on uh, Google Earth and show you the, um, the skylight that I was looking out of while I was writing this, this piece. You know, it's that easy. Um, there's, I think what this really means is there's, there's a marked blurring of the boundaries between the public and private spheres. We don't really know where, where to draw those lines anymore. 
Um, there are new vulnerabilities that these technologies raise. Um, so synthetic biology, there's the worry of, uh, of, of that being used for biological warfare, and in particular whether you can develop pathogenic organisms that go for a particular genetic sequence that will perhaps be you know, targeted at particular racial uh, markers in genomes. Um, there are all sorts of, uh, the, the, this issue of cyber warfare has become a very big uh, security worry and uh, not just intentional sort of attacks on, um, on cyber networks but also just the very development of these very strong interdependencies of our IT networks and the vulnerabilities, that, 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 that the particular vulnerabilities that they have for crashes and, uh, and, and cascades and so forth. But it's not all uh, bad news. I want uh, finally just to uh, talk about the way in which some technologies are changing the way we make things, the way we think about making things. And in particular, there's this technology called rapid prototyping, which um, uses powders that are kind of sintered together, stuck together into solid material by lasers, and can be used to build pretty much any shape you like, any object you like, in three dimensions, uh, using uh, just, just sort of programming it into the computer system, and then it goes and makes it out of this ceramic stuff. And see, you know, these are some of the structures that have been made. There's this new kind of jewellery, uh, I'm told this, this is. I'm not sure if it will catch on. But, it's, um, uh, but you know, you can, it just shows the, the, the kind of flexibility that this, uh, this technology is making. It may be that uh, you know, before very long, repair shops and garages won't have to order spare parts for the stuff we take to them. They'll just make them on the premises. Or that we won't even have to do that, we'll do it ourselves. We'll download the information and make it on our little, our, our little personal fab lab, just like our own personal, you know, we have our own uh, printers at home, because this stuff is becoming cheaper and cheaper. That's one of the reasons why there are all sorts of opportunities here for developing countries to uh, develop uh, new ways of, uh, of, of, of making things if they don't have uh, the infrastructure for distributing them. Um, I think this is uh, then mostly a positive development, although we've yet to see what it might imply for things like the way we organize industry and um, how we use materials and how we recycle materials. There are already grassroots open access movements devoted to the sorts of possibilities that this technology makes possible, like uh, it'll Make magazine that is very interested in this sort of stuff. Um, so, you know, this, these will be networks for sharing ways of doing the, the things that you can make using these technologies. And some people believe that the same sort of ethos is going to also arise in DIY biotechnology. Um, that you'll do that yourself as well as, these, uh, as the techniques and the, the instrumentation become ever cheaper and more accessible. We'll be able to do your own synthetic biology. Um, and of course there are obvious hazards that uh, might be associated with that. But I think it's also conceivable that initiatives like this could reconnect us to the, a creative relationship with materials that the Industrial Revolution um, helped to erode and take away. And it, I hope that that's something that is going to happen. Thanks very much. together in a really, um, a really clear uh, exposition. Can, um, can I ask people if they'd like to ask some questions or make some comments? Um, I'd like to ask you a bit about um, the aesthetics which scientists use when they're looking at the molecular, the way they represent them to us or, you know, the images that you've shown today, they look quite, you know, science fictional or... The way they represent them. Yeah, um, it looks very clean, doesn't it? Like yeah. in your book, the Stories of the Invisible, you, you talk about how in reality, actually protein string is very messy and they have to unravel them. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I think that's very... I mean, there's also a question of the aesthetics that they apply when they're making them as well. Mm -hmm. And there's just beginning to be a, a little field called molecular aesthetics, uh, where people are you know, thinking about how to, how to think in aesthetic terms about making molecules. And I'd love to see an artistic aesthetic brought to that, uh, that sphere in itself. You know, so far, it's been... Scientists, chemists have a, a very kind of, I think, 
simplistic and platonic idea that aesthetics is all to do with symmetry and making molecules mm -hmm. that, 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 you know, are uh, um, symmetrical. Yeah. Um, but I think there's much more interesting stuff that they could do if they, you know, had an artistic aesthetic to bring mm -hmm. what they're doing. But how they represent them is, um, has, you know, it's, it's, it's quite controversial mm -hmm. uh, in many ways because, uh, I mean, you know, if I go back to that, I mean, you, you see these sort of, yeah, like that. Yeah, like that. But, but even, you know, more so the, um, this, this representation of, uh, of nanotech, um, where uh, you see these, you know, smooth things that actually, I mean, this is unphysical. Metals don't look like that at that scale anyway. Um, and there is this huge amount of idealization that goes on. My favorite one is the way that um, the double helix is represented because you all see this lovely sort of spiral. And, you know, in, it's, it's hardly ever like that in the cell. Uh, DNA is crunched up and it's rolled around these things called histones, little cylindrical uh, protein assemblies. And then fold it up, and it's you know it's all over the place, and um, and w w it only gets uh, when it gets used, it has to be unravelled and sort of stretched out. And um, moreover, if you take DNA out of water, it looks like it's been stamped on. It doesn't look like this lovely double helix at all. So I think there's a real again this sort of idealisation that somehow you know the scientists want to present this stuff as somehow clean and beautiful, whereas in fact it's really messy. And if, you know, when they did experiments, they know that. But, it's, um, but somehow the, the idea has come across that you've got to present it in this sort of smooth, clean way, you know, with bright colors and, 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 and so forth, um, which aren't always necessarily informative and sometimes are actively misleading. Um, in fact, Felice Frankel, who uh, made this image, is someone at, um, I think she's still at MIT, who has thought a lot about this and has really sort of gone into this issue of not just how to present science effectively, um, but also the kind of the ethics of doing that and, you know, to what extent can, should you and can you manipulate the images that you get from an electron microscope or whatever to make your point, you know, is it, is it, is it valid to do that or is it actually distorting the, the science? So there's a big debate uh, around it, but I think that underneath it is this kind of impulse to clean up what they're doing, just as they clean up the accounts that you, know, you see in the scientific literature of how an experiment is done. It's always a, a post hoc narrative that is constructed. I thought this particular image you showed was interesting because it throws up a sort of slight contradiction in your talk because you said what it's not is a little robot, but at the very end you were talking about the fact that we were developing systems that you could inject into people which would pick up uh, micromarkers of precursor states to cancer. So although it would not look like a robot as we in our dandelion minds imagine a robot to look like, its functionality would essentially be exactly that, that we will be absorbing into our system, having injected of something which carries out a chemical analysis of us. And so, we will be having robots floating around in due course. In a sense, that's absolutely true. And in a sense, we will, in fact, people have also developed what they've called molecular computers, which are bits of DNA that, that act to, they, they detect stuff that's in your bloodstream and then respond to it. They kind of have a, a way of logically processing that information and actually producing, at the end of it, the protein that you need to, uh, to, to counteract whatever it is that they've, they've detected. Um, so, you know, it's absolutely true that in, in, in an abstract way, you know, that's, that, that's what's going to be happening. But the, the, the problem with this sort of uh, imagery is that it suggests that actually nanotechnology is just normal technology shrunk, that it's mechanical, it's got all these little moving parts, and there's a whole school of, uh, of, of nanotechnology that isn't taken at all seriously by the people who are actually doing the work, but that is purely theoretical, which shows you pictures of all these little machines, molecular machines, where all the atoms have been put in place, and there's cogs and levers and so on, and it's a kind of, um, uh, almost a 19th century vision of mechanical technology just made smaller. And the fact is, it doesn't work like that, and it's crazy to try to make it work like that, because, you, it, 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 because technology doesn't scale like that. 
because things like, um, you know, this stuff, a, a little device like this doesn't feel like it's floating around in water. This stuff, the water is really thick. It's yeah. almost impossible to get through at that scale. And things don't just sort of slide over each other in the simple way that they do if they're sort of, you know, teflon coated surfaces at this scale. The physics is different. So you won't do it this way. You'll do it by applying chemical intelligence. Chemistry is much more smart than this very crude, literal, mechanical way of doing things. Um, and that's really what those devices that I showed earlier, that, 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 that I showed elsewhere, and this you know, molecular computer I talked about, that's what they're using. They're use, doing things in the ways that, uh, that, that use chemi chemistry in smart ways, which is what nature does as well. Nature doesn't, you know, tend, I mean, certainly doesn't have little sort of robots like this. So yes. that's the difference. Yes, of course. And that's why you talked about biomimetics as well, because that shows the way forward how we have to rethink the, the actual way that you go about building a device. Yeah. So that you don't like, like this, as we said, an ar ar archaic concept. Of, that it's, it's, and it's, and and it's not and necessarily and just scaling down. Yes, That's yes, the crucial thing. Yes. And this again shows that, you know, that sometimes when you scale down, weird things happen. Completely different things happen. Mechanics, the, yeah. the physics forces you into a completely different way yeah. of yeah. thinking yeah. about how to make a device. Yeah. yeah. There's another question from Thank you, Ellen. This is less really less a question, more a bit of a ramble. Um, but I should preface it by saying that A, I'm not a scientist. I'm interested in culture and history. Um, and um, I, it was fun looking at your opening categories and the idea of the Herculean age, you know, this periodizing system that you're proposing. Um, but I suppose immediately I found myself thinking that um, uh, for the inhabitants of the Herculean age, their understanding, you know, I'm here, I say they, you know, I could pick a kind of, you know, a sort of a, a slice at any point across those histories, across those cultures, that their understanding of the material universe that they lived in would be radically different from your idea of kind of nothing, because, you know, there's nothing around there but rubble. You know, you would have everything there from the floggist on all the way through to kind of the Holy Spirit. So I'm thinking about, there's a slight element of kind of futurology here, which is great, and I've really, really enjoyed the loads from your presentation. But I found myself thinking that underpinning this, really the way that people, you know, the way from the really big questions down to the really minute questions, you know, the minute details of what you kind of do during your day through to actually how whole societies are organised, that these really have an awful lot more to do with what people believe is out there rather than actually what the present day scientist would maintain is out there. So um, I'm thinking, um, you know, your particular perspective on that process is a very, is itself a very historically specific one. And, um, so I'll, I'll shut up. Does that seem to make sense? Yeah, yeah, no, it that's, does. And I hope that's useful. I, absolutely, and I, I, I agree entirely that, um, you know, that, that's kind of why I said, you know, take it with a pinch of salt, that, that way of thinking about it. And I think, if I understand you rightly, I think in, in particular what's significant in some, well, I think it's still true today, but it's not acknowledged often enough, is that we have associations with materials that aren't anything to do with what they are in scientific terms. Um, that was you know, very true in the Middle Ages, where uh, materials had particular connotations and you would use finest materials to make an altarpiece, for example. It wasn't, it wasn't just about how it looked, or even primarily about how it looked. It was about the fact that these were costly materials that were offerings to God, that they had sort of spiritual connotations. And in some sort of probably secular way, I think that there's, it's, that's still true today. We, I mean, it's, it's trivially true in the sense that we have associations about synthetic materials. Um, that you know, there are all sorts of preconceptions that go along with those, with just sort of using that that term, um, as opposed to natural materials. And uh, you know, I think that, uh, and and when we're working in materials that have deep cultural roots, like water and gold, um, you can actually see that the science of using those materials isn't immune to the sort of cultural associations that we have towards them. So I don't know if that quite. Sort of picks up from what you're saying, but I think it's uh, it's absolutely true that you know, there's I, I, more to it than atoms. Right. Yeah, but yes, I think that I think that probably the consequences of the consequences of, of how 
belief systems shape you know, actual decisions about what we do and don't do with stuff, I suspect will continue to be far more powerful determinations ultimately of what gets made than, than, than actual you know, hard science, you know, the empirical stuff. But then I would say that because I'm, <laughs> because I'm a historian. So. Yeah, but I wouldn't necessarily disagree with that.